Les Miserables. Volume 1. Fontaine. Book 2nd. The Fall. By Victor Hugo. Narrated by Peter Silverleaf. Chapter 1. The Evening of a Day of Walking. Early in the month of October 1815, about an hour before sunset, a man who was travelling on foot entered the little town of D. The few inhabitants who were at their windows or on their thresholds at the moment stared at this traveller with a sort of uneasiness. It was difficult to encounter a wayfarer of more wretched appearance. He was a man of medium stature, thick-set and robust, in the prime of life. He must have been forty-six or forty-eight years old. A cap with a drooping leather visor partly concealed his face, burned and tanned by sun and wind, and dripping with perspiration. His shirt of coarse yellow linen, fastened at the neck by a small silver anchor, permitted a view of his hairy breast. He had a cravat twisted into a string, trousers of blue drilling worn and threadbare, white on one knee and torn on the other, an old grey tattered blouse, patched on one of the elbows with a bit of green cloth sewed on with twine, a tightly packed soldier knapsack, well buckled and perfectly new on his back, an enormous knotty stick in his hand, iron-shod shoes on his stockingless feet, a shaved head and a long beard. The sweat, the heat, the journey on foot, the dust, added I know not what sordid quality to this dilapidated hole. His hair was closely cut, yet bristling, for it had begun to grow a little, and did not seem to have been cut for some time. No one knew him. He was evidently only a chance passer-by. Whence came he? From the south? From the seashore, perhaps? For he made his entrance into D by the same street which, seven months previously, had witnessed the passage of the Emperor Napoleon on his way from Cannes to Paris. This man must have been walking all day. He seemed very much fatigued. Some women of the ancient market town, which is situated below the city, had seen him pause beneath the trees of the Boulevard Gassendi, and drink at the fountain which stands at the end of the promenade. He must have been very thirsty, for the children who followed him saw him stop again for a drink, two hundred paces farther on, at the fountain in the marketplace. On arriving at the corner of the Rue pois he turned to the left and directed his steps towards the town hall. He entered, then came out a quarter of an hour later. A gendarme was seated near the door, on the stone bench which General Draou had mounted on the 4th of March to read to the frightened throng of the inhabitants of D the proclamation of the Gulf Juan. The man pulled off his cap and humbly saluted the gendarme. The gendarme, without replying to his salute, stared attentively at him, followed him for a while with his eyes, and then entered the town hall. There then existed at D a fine inn at the sign of the Cross of Colba. This inn had for a landlord a certain Jacquin Labar, a man of consideration in the town on account of his relationship to another Labar, who kept the inn of the three dauphins in Grenoble, and had served in the Guides. At the time of the Emperor's landing, many rumours had circulated throughout the country with regard to this inn of the Three Dauphins. It was said that General Bertrand, disguised as a carter, had made frequent trips thither in the month of January, and that he had distributed crosses of honour to the soldiers and handfuls of gold to the citizens. The truth is that when the Emperor entered Grenoble, he had refused to install himself at the hotel of the prefecture. He had thanked the mayor, saying, I am going to the house of a brave man of my acquaintance, and he had betaken himself to the three dauphins. This glory of the labar of the three dauphins was reflected upon the labar of the cross of Colba, at a distance of five and twenty leagues. It was said of him in the town, That is the cousin of the man of Grenoble. The man bent his steps towards this inn, which was the best in the countryside. He entered the kitchen, which opened on a level with the street. All the stoves were lighted, a huge fire blazed gaily in the fireplace. The host, who was also the chief cook, was going from one stew pan to another, very busily superintending an excellent dinner designed for the wagoners, whose loud talking, conversation, and laughter were audible from an adjoining apartment. 
Anyone who has travelled knows that there is no one who indulges in better cheer than wagoners. A fat marmot, flanked by white partridges and heather cocks, was turning on a long spit before the fire. On the stove, two huge carps from Lake Lozé and a trout from Lake Aloz were cooking. The host, hearing the door open and seeing a newcomer enter, said, without raising his eyes from his stoves, What do you wish, sir? Food and lodging, said the man. Nothing easier, replied the host. At that moment he turned his head, took in the traveller's appearance with a single glance, and added, By paying for it? The man drew a large leather purse from the pocket of his blouse and answered, I have money. In that case we are at your service, said the host. The man put his purse back in his pocket, removed his knapsack from his back, put it on the ground near the door, retained his stick in his hand, and seated himself on a low stool close to the fire. D is in the mountains. The evenings are cold there in October. But as the host went back and forth, he scrutinized the traveller. Will dinner be ready soon? said the man. Immediately, replied the landlord. While the newcomer was warming himself before the fire, with his back turned, the worthy host, Jacquin Labat, drew a pencil from his pocket, then tore off the corner of an old newspaper which was lying on a small table near the window. On the white margin he wrote a line or two, folded it without sealing, and then entrusted this scrap of paper to a child who seemed to serve him in the capacity of both of scullion and lackey. The landlord whispered a word in the scullion's ear, and the child set off on a run in the direction of the town hall. The traveller saw nothing of all this. Once more he inquired, Will dinner be ready soon? Immediately, responded the host. The child returned. He brought back the paper. The host unfolded it eagerly, like a person who is expecting a reply. He seemed to read it attentively, then tossed his head and remained thoughtful for a moment. Then he took a step in the direction of the traveller, who appeared to be immersed in reflections which were not very serene. I cannot receive you, sir, said he. The man half rose. What? Are you afraid that I will not pay you? Do you want me to pay you in advance? I have money, I tell you. It's not that. What, then? You have money. Yes, said the man. And I, said the host, have no room. The man resumed tranquilly, Put me in the stable. I cannot. Why? The horses take up all the space. Very well, retorted the man. A corner of the loft, then, a truss of straw. We will see about that after dinner. I cannot give you any dinner. This declaration, made in a measured but firm tone, struck the stranger as grave. He rose. Ah, oh, bah, but I am dying of hunger. I have been walking since sunrise. I have travelled twelve leagues. I pay. I wish to eat. I have nothing, said the landlord. The man burst out laughing and turned towards the fireplace and the stoves. Nothing? And all that? All that is engaged. By whom? By messieurs the wagoners. How many are there of them? Twelve. There is enough food there for twenty. They have engaged the whole of it and paid for it in advance. The man seated himself again and said, without raising his voice, I am at an inn, I am hungry and I shall remain. Then the host bent down to his ear and said in a tone which made him start, Go away. At that moment the traveller was bending forward and thrusting some brands into the fire with the iron-shod tip of his staff. He turned quickly round, and as he opened his mouth to reply, the host gazed steadily at him and added, still in a low voice, Stop. There's enough of that sort of talk. Do you want me to tell you your name? Your name is Jean Valjean. Now, do you want me to tell you who you are? When I saw you come in, I suspected something. I sent to the town hall, and this was the reply that was sent to me. Can you read? So saying, he held out to the stranger, fully unfolded, the paper which had just travelled from the inn to the town hall, and from the town hall to the inn. The man cast a glance upon it. The landlord resumed after a pause. I am in the habit of being polite to everyone. Go away. The man dropped his head, picked up the knapsack which he had deposited on the ground, and took his departure. He chose the principal street. He walked straight on at a venture, keeping close to the houses like a sad, humiliated man. He did not turn round a single time. Had he done so, 
he would have seen the host of the Cross of Colbus standing on his threshold, surrounded by all the guests of his inn and all the passers-by in the street, talking vivaciously and pointing him out with his finger, and from the glances of terror and distrust cast by the group, he might have divined that his arrival would speedily become an event for the whole town. He saw nothing of all this. People who are crushed do not look behind them. They know but too well the evil fate which follows them. Thus he proceeded for some time, walking on without ceasing, traversing at random streets of which he knew nothing, forgetting of his fatigue, as is often the case when a man is sad. All at once he felt the pangs of hunger sharply. Night was drawing near. He glanced about him to see whether he could not discover some shelter. A fine hostelry was closed to him. He was seeking some very humble public house, some hovel, however lowly. Just then a light flashed up at the end of the streets. A pine branch suspended from a cross beam of iron was outlined against the white sky of the twilight. He proceeded thither. It proved to be, in fact, a public house, the public house which is in the Rue du Chafou. The wayfarer halted for a moment and peeped through the window into the interior of the low-studded room of the public house, illuminated by a small lamp on a table and by a large fire on the hearth. Some men were engaged in drinking there. The landlord was warming himself. An iron pot suspended from a crane bubbled over the flame. The entrance to this public house, which is also a sort of an inn, is by two doors. One opens on the street, the other upon a small yard filled with manure. The traveller dare not enter by the street door. He slipped into the yard, halted again, then raised the latch timidly and opened the door. Who goes there? said the master. Someone who wants supper and a bed. Good, we furnish supper and bed here. He entered. All the men who were drinking turned round. The lamp illuminated him on one side, the firelight on the other. They examined him for some time while he was taking off his knapsack. The host said to him, There is the fire, the supper is cooking in the pot. Come and warm yourself, comrade. He approached and seated himself near the hearth. He stretched out his feet, which were exhausted with fatigue to the fire. A fine odour was emitted by the pot. All that could be distinguished of his face beneath his cap, which was well pulled down, assumed a vague appearance of comfort, mingled with that other poignant aspect which habitual suffering bestows. It was, moreover, a firm, energetic and melancholy profile. This physiognomy was strangely composed. It began by seeming humble and ended by seeming severe. The eye shone beneath its lashes like a fire beneath brushwood. One of the men seated at the table, however, was a fishmonger who, before entering the public house of the Rue de Chafaud, had been to stable his horse at Le Bar's. It chanced that he had that very morning encountered this unprepossessing stranger on the road between Bradas and I have forgotten the name. I think it was Escoublon. Now, when he met him, the man, who then seemed already extremely weary, had requested him to take him on his crupper, to which the fishmonger had made no reply except by redoubling his gait. This fishmonger had been a member half an hour previously of the group which surrounded Jacquin Labarre, and had himself related his disagreeable encounter of the morning to the people at the cross of Colbert. From where he sat he made an imperceptible sign to the tavern-keeper. The tavern-keeper went to him. They exchanged a few words in a low tone. The man had again become absorbed in his reflections. The tavern-keeper returned to the fireplace, laid his hand abruptly on the shoulder of the man, and said to him, You are going to get out of here. The stranger turned round and replied gently, Ah, you know. Yes. I was sent away from the other inn. And you are to be turned out of this one. Where would you have me go? Elsewhere. The man took his stick and his knapsack and departed. As he went out, some children who had followed him from the cross of Colbert, and who seemed to be lying in wait for him, threw stones at him. He retraced his steps in anger and threatened them with his stick. The children dispersed like a flock of birds. He passed before the prison. At the door hung an iron chain attached to a bell. He rang. The wicket opened. Turn key, said he, removing his cap politely. Will you have the kindness to admit me and give me a lodging for the night? A voice replied, 
The prison is not an inn. Get yourself arrested and you will be admitted. The wicket closed again. He entered a little street in which there were many gardens. Some of them were enclosed only by hedges, which lends a cheerful aspect to the street. In the midst of these gardens and hedges he caught sight of a small house of a single story, the window of which was lighted up. He peered through the pane as he had done at the public house. Within was a large whitewashed room with a bed draped in printed cotton stuff and a cradle in one corner, a few wooden chairs and a double-barreled gun hanging on the wall. A table was spread in the centre of the room. A copper lamp illuminated the tablecloth of coarse white linen, the pewter jug shining like silver and filled with wine and the brown smoking soup tureen. At this table sat a man of about forty with a merry and open countenance who was dandling a little child on his knees. Close by, a very young woman was nursing another child. The father was laughing, the child was laughing, the mother was smiling. The stranger paused a moment in reverie before this tender and calming spectacle. What was taking place within him? He alone could have told. It is probable that he thought that this joyous house would be hospitable, and that, in a place where he beheld so much happiness, he would find perhaps a little pity. He tapped on the pane with a very small and feeble knock. They did not hear him. He tapped again. He heard the woman say, It seems to me, husband, that someone is knocking. No, replied the husband. He tapped a third time. The husband rose, took the lamp, and went to the door which he opened. He was a man of lofty stature, half peasant, half artisan. He wore a huge leather apron which reached to his left shoulder, and which a hammer and a red handkerchief, a powder horn, and all sorts of objects which were upheld by the girdle as in a pocket, caused to bulge out. He carried his head thrown backwards, his shirt widely opened and turned back, displayed his bull neck white and bare. He had thick eyelashes, enormous black whiskers, prominent eyes, the lower part of his face like a snout, and besides all this, that air of being on his own ground, which is indescribable. Pardon me, sir, said the wayfarer. Could you, in consideration of payment, Give me a plate of soup and a corner of that shed yonder in the garden in which to sleep. Tell me, can you, for money? Who are you? demanded the master of the house. The man replied, I have just come from Puy Moussin. I have walked all day long. I have travelled twelve leagues. Can you, if I pay? I would not refuse, said the peasant, to lodge any respectable man who would pay me. But why do you not go to the inn? There is no room. Ah! Impossible. This is neither a fair nor a market day. Have you been to Le Bar? Yes. Well? The traveller replied with embarrassment, I do not know. He did not receive me. Uh, have you been to what's-his-names in the Rue Chaffaut? The stranger's embarrassment increased. He stammered. He did not receive me either. The peasant's countenance assumed an expression of distrust. He surveyed the newcomer from head to feet, and suddenly exclaimed with a sort of shudder, are you the man? He cast a fresh glance upon the stranger, took three steps backwards, placed a lamp on the table, and took his gun down from the wall. Meanwhile, at the words, Are you the man? the woman had risen, had clasped her two children in her arms, and had taken refuge precipitately behind her husband, staring in terror at the stranger, with her bosom uncovered, and with frightened eyes as she murmured in a low tone, So maraud! Patois of the French Alps, Chat de Maraud, rascally marauder. All this took place in less time than it requires to picture it to oneself. After having scrutinised the man for several moments, as one scrutinises a viper, the master of the house returned to the door and said, Clear out, for pity's sake, a glass of water, said the man. A shot from my gun, said the peasant. Then he closed the door violently, and the man heard him shoot two large bolts. A moment later, the window shutter was closed, and the sound of a bar of iron which was placed against it was audible outside. Night continued to fall. A cold wind from the Alps was blowing. By the light of the expiring day, the stranger perceived in one of the gardens which bordered the streets a sort of hut, which seemed to him to be built of sods. He climbed over the wooden fence resolutely, and found himself in the garden. He approached the hut. Its door consisted of a very low and narrow aperture, and it resembled those buildings which road labourers construct for themselves along the roads. He thought, without doubt, that it was, 
in fact, the dwelling of a road labourer. He was suffering from cold and hunger, but this was at least a shelter from the cold. This sort of dwelling is not usually occupied at night. He threw himself flat on his face and crawled into the hut. It was warm there, and he found a tolerably good bed of straw. He lay for a moment stretched out on this bed, without the power to make a movement, so fatigued was he. Then, as the knapsack on his back was in his way, and as it furnished moreover a pillow ready to his hand, he set about unbuckling one of the straps. At that moment a ferocious growl became audible. He raised his eyes. The head of an enormous dog was outlined in the darkness at the entrance of the hut. It was a dog's kennel. He was himself vigorous and formidable. He armed himself with his staff, made a shield of his knapsack, and made his way out of the kennel in the best way he could, not without enlarging the rents in his rags. He left the garden in the same manner but backwards, being obliged, in order to keep the dog respectful, to have recourse to that manoeuvre with his stick which masters in that sort of fencing designate as la rose couverte. When he had, not without difficulty, repassed the fence and found himself once more in the street, alone, without refuge, without shelter, without a roof over his head, chased even from that bed of straw and from that miserable kennel, he dropped rather than seated himself on a stone, and it appears that a passer-by heard him exclaim, I am not even a dog. He soon rose again and resumed his march. He went out of the town, hoping to find some tree or haystack in the fields which would afford him shelter. He walked thus for some time with his head still drooping. When he felt himself far from every human habitation, he raised his eyes and gazed searchingly about him. He was in a field. Before him was one of those low hills covered with close-cut stubble, which, after the harvest, resemble shaved heads. The horizon was perfectly black. This was not alone the obscurity of night. It was caused by very low-hanging clouds, which seemed to rest upon the hill itself, and which were mounting and filling the whole sky. Meanwhile, as the moon was about to rise, and as there was still floating in the zenith a remnant of the brightness of twilight, these clouds formed at the summit of the sky a sort of whitish arch whence a gleam of light fell upon the earth. The earth was thus better lighted than the sky, which produces a particularly sinister effect, and the hill, whose contour was poor and mean, was outlined vague and worn against the gloomy horizon. The whole effect was hideous, petty, lugubrious, and narrow. There was nothing in the field or on the hill except a deformed tree which writhed and shivered a few paces distant from the wayfarer. This man was evidently very far from having those delicate habits of intelligence and spirit which render one sensible to the mysterious aspects of things. Nevertheless, there was something in that sky, in that hill, in that plain, in that tree, which was so profoundly desolate that after a moment of immobility and reverie he turned back abruptly. There are instants when nature seems hostile. He retraced his steps. The gates of D were closed. D, which had sustained sieges during the wars of religion, was still surrounded in 1815 by ancient walls flanked by square towers, which have been demolished since. He passed through a breach and entered the town again. It might have been eight o'clock in the evening. As he was not acquainted with the streets, he recommenced his walk at random. In this way he came to the prefecture, then to the seminary. As he passed through the cathedral square, he shook his fist at the church. At the corner of this square there is a printing establishment. It is there that the proclamations of the emperor and of the imperial guard to the army, brought from the island of Elba and dictated by Napoleon himself, were printed for the first time. Worn out with fatigue and no longer entertaining any hope, he lay down on a stone bench which stands at the doorway of this printing office. At that moment an old woman came out of the church. She saw the man stretched out in the shadow. "'What are you doing there, my friend?' said she. He answered harshly and angrily, "'As you see, my good woman, I am sleeping.' The good woman, who was well worthy the name, in fact, was the Marquise de R. "'On this bench?' she went on. "'I have had a mattress of wood for nineteen years,' said the man. "'Today I have a mattress of stone.' "'You have been a soldier?' "'Yes, my good woman, a soldier. "'Why do you not go to the inn?' "'Because I have no money.' Alas, said the Madame de R, I have only four sous in my purse. Give it to me all the same. 
The man took the four sous. Madame de R. continued. You cannot obtain lodgings in an inn for so small a sum. But have you tried? It is impossible for you to pass the night thus. You are cold and hungry, no doubt. Someone might have given you a lodging out of charity. I have knocked at all the doors. Well, I have been driven away everywhere. The good woman touched the man's arm and pointed out to him on the other side of the street a small low house which stood beside the bishop's palace. You have knocked at all the doors? Yes. Have you knocked at that one? No. Knock there. Chapter 2 Prudence Counseled to Wisdom That evening the Bishop of D, after his promenade through the town, remained shut up rather late in his room. He was busy over a great work on duties, which was never completed, unfortunately. He was carefully compiling everything that the fathers and doctors have said on this important subject. His book was divided into two parts— Firstly, the duties of all, secondly, the duties of each individual, according to the class to which he belongs. The duties of all are the great duties. There are four of these. St. Matthew points them out. Duties towards God, Matthew 6. Duties towards oneself, Matthew 5, 29, 30. Duties towards one's neighbor, Matthew 7, 12. Duties towards animals, Matthew 6, 20, 25. As for the other duties, the bishop found them pointed out and prescribed elsewhere, to sovereigns and subjects, in the epistle to the Romans, to magistrates, to wives, to mothers, to young men, by St. Peter, to husbands, fathers, children, and servants, in the epistle to the Ephesians, to the faithful, in the epistle to the Hebrews, to the virgins, in the epistle to the Corinthians. Out of these precepts he was laboriously constructing a harmonious whole, which he desired to present to souls. At eight o'clock he was still at work, writing with a good deal of inconvenience upon little squares of paper, with a big book open on his knees, when Madame de Malois entered, according to her wont, to get the silverware from the cupboard near his bed. A moment later the bishop, knowing that the table was set, and that his sister was probably waiting for him, shut his book, rose from his table, and entered the dining-room. The dining-room was an oblong apartment with a fireplace, which had a door opening on the street, as we have said, and a window opening on the garden. Madame Malois was, in fact, just putting the last touches to the table. As she performed this service, she was conversing with Mademoiselle Battistine. A lamp stood on the table. The table was near the fireplace. A wood fire was burning there. One can easily picture to oneself these two women, both of whom were over sixty years of age. Madame Malois, small, plump, vivacious, Madame Battistine, gentle, slender, frail, somewhat taller than her brother, dressed in a gown of puce-coloured silk, of the fashion of 1806, which she had purchased at that date in Paris, and which had lasted ever since. To borrow vulgar phrases, which possess the merit of giving utterance in a single word to an idea which a whole page would hardly suffice to express, Madame Malois had the air of a peasant, and Mademoiselle Battistine that of a lady. Madame Malois wore a white quilted cap, a gold Jeannette cross on a velvet ribbon upon her neck, the only bit of feminine jewellery that there was in the house, a very white fichu puffing out from a gown of coarse black woollen stuff, with large short sleeves, an apron of cotton cloth in red and green checks, knotted round the waist with a green ribbon, with a stomacher of the same attached by two pins at the upper corners, coarse shoes on her feet, and yellow stockings like the women of Marseilles. Mademoiselle Battistine's gown was cut on the patterns of 1806 with a short waist, a narrow sheath-like skirt, puffed sleeves with flaps and buttons. She concealed her grey hair under a frizzed wig known as the baby wig. Madame Malois had an intelligent, vivacious and kindly air, the two corners of her mouth unequally raised, and her upper lip, which was larger than the lower, imparted to her a rather crabbed and imperious look. So long as Monseigneur held his peace, she talked to him resolutely with a mixture of respect and freedom. But as soon as Monseigneur began to speak, as we have seen, she obeyed passively like her mistress. Mademoiselle Battistine did not even speak. She confined herself to obeying and pleasing him. She had never been pretty, even when she was young. She had large, blue, prominent eyes and a long, arched nose, 
but her whole visage, her whole person, breathed forth an ineffable goodness, as we stated in the beginning. She had always been predestined to gentleness, but faith, charity, hope, those three virtues which mildly warm the soul, had gradually elevated that gentleness to sanctity. Nature had made her a lamb, religion had made her an angel. Poor, sainted virgin, sweet memory which has vanished. Mademoiselle Battistine has so often narrated what passed at the Episcopal residence that evening, that there are many people now living who still recall the most minute details. At the moment when the bishop entered, Madame Malhois was talking with considerable vivacity. She was haranguing Mademoiselle Battistine on a subject which was familiar to her and to which the bishop was also accustomed. The question concerned the lock upon the entrance door. It appears that while procuring some provisions for supper, Madame Malhois had heard things in diverse places. People had spoken of a prowler of evil appearance. A suspicious vagabond had arrived who must be somewhere about the town, and those who should take it into their heads to return home late that night might be subjected to unpleasant encounters. The police was very badly organized, moreover, because there was no love lost between the prefect and the mayor, who sought to injure each other by making things happen. It behooved wise people to play the part of their own police, and to guard themselves well, and care must be taken to duly close, bar, and barricade their houses, and to fasten the doors well. Madame Malois emphasized these last words, but the bishop had just come from his room, where it was rather cold. He seated himself in front of the fire and warmed himself, and then fell to thinking of other things. He did not take up the remark dropped with design by Madame Malois. She repeated it. Then Mademoiselle Battistine, desirous of satisfying Madame Malois without displeasing her brother, ventured to say timidly, Did you hear what Madame Malois is saying, brother? I have heard something of it in a vague way, replied the bishop, then half turning in his chair, placing his hands on his knees, and raising towards the old servant woman his cordial face, which so easily grew joyous, and which was illuminated from below by the firelight. Come, what is the matter? What is the matter? Are we in any great danger? Then Madame Malhois began the whole story afresh, exaggerating it a little without being aware of the fact. It appeared that a bohemian, a barefooted vagabond, a sort of dangerous mendicant, was at that moment in the town. He had presented himself at Jacquin Labaz to obtain lodgings, but the latter had not been willing to take him in. He had been seen to arrive by the way of the Boulevard Gassendi and roam about the streets in the gloaming a gallows-bird with a terrible face. Really? said the bishop. This willingness to interrogate encouraged Madame Malois. It seemed to her to indicate that the bishop was on the point of becoming alarmed. She pursued triumphantly. Yes, monsieur, that is how it is. There will be some sort of catastrophe in this town tonight. Everyone says so. And with all, the police is so badly regulated. A useful repetition. The idea of living in a mountainous country and not even having lights in the streets at night. One goes out black as ovens indeed, and I say, Monseigneur and Mademoiselle, there says with me. I, interrupted his sister, say nothing. What my brother does is well done. Madame Malois continued as though there had been no protest. We say that this house is not safe at all, that if Monseigneur will permit, I will go and tell Paulin Mousbois, the locksmith, to come and replace the ancient locks on the doors. We have them, and it is only the work of a moment for I say that nothing is more terrible than a door which can be opened from the outside with a latch by the first passer-by, and I say that we need bolts, Monseigneur, if only for this night. Moreover, Monseigneur has the habit of always saying, Come in, and besides, even in the middle of the night, Oh, mon Dieu, there is no need to ask permission. At that moment there came a tolerably violent knock on the door. Come in, said the bishop. Chapter 3 The Heroism of Passive Obedience The door opened. It opened wide with a rapid movement, as though someone had given it an energetic and resolute push. A man entered. We already know the man. It was the wayfarer whom we have seen wandering about in search of shelter. He entered, advanced a step, and halted, leaving the door open behind him. He had his knapsack on his shoulders, his cudgel in his hand, a rough, audacious, weary, and violent expression in his eyes. 
The fire on the hearth lighted him up. He was hideous. It was a sinister apparition. Madame Malois had not even the strength to utter a cry. She trembled and stood with her mouth wide open. Mademoiselle Battistine turned round, beheld the man entering, and half started up in terror. Then, turning her head by degrees towards the fireplace again, she began to observe her brother, and her face became once more profoundly calm and serene. The bishop fixed a tranquil eye on the man. As he opened his mouth, doubtless to ask the newcomer what he desired, the man rested both hands on his staff, directed his gaze at the old man and the two women, and without waiting for the bishop to speak, he said in a loud voice, See here, my name is Jean Valjean. I am a convict from the galleys. I have passed nineteen years in the galleys. I was liberated four days ago, and I am on my way to Pontalier, which is my destination. I have been walking for four days since I left Toulon. I have travelled a dozen leagues today on foot. This evening, when I arrived in these parts, I went to an inn, and they turned me out because of my yellow passport, which I had shown at the town hall. I had to do it. I went to an inn. They said to me, Be off at both places. No one would take me. I went to the prison. The jailer would not admit me. I went into a dog's kennel. The dog bit me and chased me off, as though he had been a man. One would have said that he knew who I was. I went into the fields, intending to sleep in the open air beneath the stars. There were no stars. I thought it was going to rain, and I re-entered the town to seek the recess of a doorway. Yonder in the square I meant to sleep on a stone bench. A good woman pointed out your house to me and said to me, Knock there. I have knocked. What is this place? Do you keep an inn? I have money, savings. One hundred and nine francs fifteen sous, which I earned in the galleys by my labour, in the course of nineteen years. I will pay. What is that to me? I have money. I am very weary. Twelve leagues on foot. I am very hungry. Are you willing that I should remain? Madame Malois, said the bishop, you will set another place. The man advanced three paces and approached the lamp which was on the table. Stop, he resumed, as though he had not quite understood. That's not it. Do you hear? I am a galley slave, a convict. I come from the galleys. He drew from his pocket a large sheet of yellow paper, which he unfolded. Here is my passport, yellow as you see. This serves to expel me from every place where I go. Will you read it? I know how to read. I learned in the galleys. There is a school there for those who choose to learn. Oh, this is what they put on the passport. Jean Vangin, discharged convict, native of... That is nothing to you. Has been nineteen years in the galleys, five years for housebreaking and burglary. Fourteen years for having attempted to escape on four occasions. He is a very dangerous man. There, everyone has cast me out. Are you willing to receive me? Is this an inn? Will you give me something to eat and a bed? Have you a stable? Madame Malois, said the bishop, you will put white sheets on the bed in the alcove. We have already explained the character of the two women's obedience. Madame Malois retired to execute these orders. The bishop returned to the man. Sit down, sir, and warm yourself. We are going to sup in a few moments, and your bed will be prepared while you are supping. At this point the man suddenly comprehended. The expression of his face, up to that time sombre and harsh, bore the imprint of stupefaction, of doubt, of joy, became extraordinary. He began stammering like a crazy man. Really? What? You will keep me? You do not drive me forth, a convict? You call me sir? You do not address me as thou? Get out of here, you dog? is what people always say to me. I felt sure you would expel me, so I told you at once who I am. Oh, what a good woman that was who directed me hither. I am going to sup, a bed with a mattress and sheets like the rest of the world, a bed. It is nineteen years since I have slept in a bed. You actually do not want me to go. You are good people. Besides, I have money. I will pay well. Pardon me, monsieur, the innkeeper, but what is your name? I will pay anything you ask. You are a fine man. You are an innkeeper, are you not? I am, replied the bishop, a priest who lives here. A priest, said the man. Oh, what a fine priest. Then you are not going to demand any money of me? You are the cure, are you not? The cure of this big church? Well, I am a fool, truly. I had not perceived your skullcap. 
As he spoke, he deposited his knapsack and his cudgel in a corner, replaced his passport in his pocket, and seated himself. Mademoiselle Battistine gazed mildly at him. He continued, "'You are humane, Monsieur Le Cure. You have not scorned me. A priest is a very good thing. Then you do not require me to pay?' "'No,' said the bishop. "'Keep your money. How much have you? Did you not tell me one hundred and nine francs?' "'And fifteen sous,' added the man. "'One hundred and nine francs, fifteen sous. And how long did it take you to earn that?' Nineteen years. Nineteen years. The bishop sighed deeply. The man continued, I have still the whole of my money. In four days I have spent only twenty-five sous, which I earn by helping unload some wagons at grass. Since you are an abbe, I will tell you that we had a chaplain in the galleys, and one day I saw a bishop there. Monsignor is what they call him. He was the bishop of Maggiore at Marseille. He is the cure who rules over the other cures, you understand. Pardon me, I say that very badly, but it is such a far-off thing to me. You understand what we are. He said mass in the middle of the galleys on an altar. He had a pointed thing made of gold on his head. It glittered in the bright light of midday. We were all ranged in lines on the three sides with cannons with lighted matches facing us. We could not see very well. He spoke, but he was too far off and we did not hear. Uh, that is what a bishop is like. While he was speaking, the bishop had gone and shut the door, which had remained wide open. Madame Malois returned. She brought a silver fork and spoon, which she placed on the table. Madame Malois, said the bishop, place those things as near the fire as possible. And turning to his guest, the night wind is harsh on the Alps. You must be cold, sir. Each time that he uttered the word sir, in his voice which was so gently grave and polished, the man's face lighted up. Monsieur, to a convict, is like a glass of water to one of the shipwrecked of the Medusa. Ignomy thirsts for consideration. This lamp gives a very bad light, said the bishop. Madame Malois understood him, and went to get the two silver candlesticks from the chimney-piece in Monseigneur's bedchamber, and placed them lighted on the table. Monsieur Le Cure, said the man, you are good, you do not despise me. You receive me into your house, you light your candles for me. Yet I have not concealed from you whence I come, and that I am an unfortunate man. The bishop, who was sitting close to him, gently touched his hand. You could not help telling me who you were. This is not my house, it is the house of Jesus Christ. This door does not demand of him who enters whether he has a name, but whether he has a grief. You suffer, you are hungry and thirsty, you are welcome. And do not thank me, do not say that I receive you in my house. No one is at home here except a man who needs a refuge. I say to you, who are passing by, that you are much more at home here than I am myself. Everything here is yours. What need have I to know your name? Besides, before you told me you had one which I knew. The man opened his eyes in astonishment. Really? You knew what I was called? Yes, replied the bishop. You are called my brother. Stop, Monsieur Le Cure, exclaimed the man. I was very hungry when I entered, but you are so good that I no longer know what has happened to me. The bishop looked at him and said, You have suffered much. Oh, the red coat, the ball on the ankle, a plank to sleep on, heat, cold, toil, the convicts, the thrashings, the double chain for nothing, the cell for one word, even sick in bed, still the chain. Dogs, dogs are happier. Nineteen years, I am forty-six, now there is the yellow passport. That is what it is like. Yes, resumed the bishop, you have come from a very sad place. Listen. There will be more joy in heaven over the tear-bathed face of a repentant sinner than over the white robes of a hundred just men. If you emerge from that sad place with thoughts of hatred and of wrath against mankind, you are deserving of pity. If you emerge with thoughts of good will and of peace, you are more worthy than any one of us. In the meantime, Madame Malois had served supper, soup made with water, oil, bread and salt, a little bacon, a bit of mutton, figs, a fresh cheese, and a large loaf of rye bread. She had, of her own accord, added to the bishop's ordinary fare a bottle of his old mauve wine. The bishop's face at once assumed that expression of gaiety which is peculiar to hospitable natures. To table, he cried vivaciously, as was his custom when a stranger supped with him, he made the man sit on his right. Mademoiselle Battistine, perfectly peaceable and natural, took her seat at his left. 
The bishop asked a blessing, then helped the soup himself. According to his custom, the man began to eat with avidity. All at once the bishop said, It strikes me there is something missing on this table. Madame Malois had in fact only placed the three sets of forks and spoons which were absolutely necessary. Now it was the usage of the house, when the bishop had any one to supper, to lay out the whole six sets of silver on the tablecloth, an innocent ostentation. This graceful semblance of luxury was a kind of child's play, which was full of charm in that gentle and severe household which raised poverty into dignity. Madame Malois understood the remark, went out without saying a word, and a moment later the three sets of silver forks and spoons demanded by the bishop were glittering upon the cloth, symmetrically arranged before the three persons seated at the table. Chapter 4 Details Concerning the Cheese Dairies of Pontalier Now, in order to convey an idea of what passed at that table, we cannot do better than to transcribe here a passage from one of Mademoiselle Battistine's letters to Madame Boischevron, wherein the conversation between the convict and the bishop is described with ingenious minuteness. This man paid no attention to anyone. He ate with the veracity of a starving man. However, after supper, he said, Monsieur le cure of the good God, all this is far too good for me, but I must say that the carters who would not allow me to eat with them keep a better table than you do. Between ourselves, the remark rather shocked me. My brother replied, They are more fatigued than I. No, returned the man, they have more money. You are poor, I see that plainly. You cannot even be a curate. Are you really a cure? Ah, but if the good God were but just, you certainly ought to be a cure. The good God is more than just, said my brother. A moment later he added, Monsieur Jean Valjean, is it to Pontalier that you are going? With my road marked out for me. I think that it is what the man said. Then he went on, I must be on my way by daybreak tomorrow. Travelling is hard. If the nights are cold, the days are hot. You are going to a good country, said my brother. During the revolution my family was ruined. I took refuge in Franche Comte at first, and there I lived for some time by the toil of my hands. My will was good. I found plenty to occupy me. One has only to choose. There are paper mills, tanneries, distilleries, oil factories, watch factories on a large scale, steel mills, copper works, twenty iron foundries at least, four of which situated at Lodz, at Châtillon, at Audincourt, and at Burr, are tolerably large. I think I am not mistaken in saying that those are the names which my brother mentioned. Then he interrupted himself and addressed me. Have we not some relatives in those parts, my dear sister? I replied. We did have some, among others, Monsieur de Lucenay, who was captain of the gates at Pontalier under the old regime. Yes, resumed my brother, but in ninety-three one had no longer any relatives. One had only one's arms. I worked. They have in the country of Pontalier, whither you are going, Monsieur Valjean, a truly patriarchal and truly charming industry, my sister. It is their cheese dairies, which they call fruitières. Then my brother, while urging the man to eat, explained to him, with great minuteness, what these fruitières of Pontalier were, that they were divided into two classes, the big barns, which belong to the rich, and where there are forty or fifty cows, which produce from seven to eight thousand cheeses each summer, and the associated fruitière, which belong to the poor. These are the peasants of Mid-Mountain, who hold their cows in common and share the proceeds. They engage the services of a cheesemaker whom they call the Gourin. The Gourin receives the milk of the associates three times a day and marks the quantity on a double tally. It is towards the end of April that the work of the cheese dairies begins. It is towards the middle of June that the cheesemakers drive their cows to the mountains. The man recovered his animation as he ate. My brother made him drink that good mauve wine, which he does not drink himself, because he says that wine is expensive. My brother imparted all these details with that easy gaiety of his, with which you are acquainted, interspersing his words with graceful attentions to me. He recurred frequently to that comfortable trade of Gouin, as though he wished the man to understand, without advising him directly and harshly, that this would afford him a refuge. One thing struck me. This man was what I have told you. 
Well, neither during supper nor during the entire evening did my brother utter a single word with the exception of a few words about Jesus when he entered, which could remind the man of what he was, nor of what my brother was. To all appearances, it was an occasion for preaching him a little sermon, and of impressing the bishop on the convict, so that a mark of the passage might remain behind. This might have appeared to any one else who had this unfortunate man in his hands to afford a chance to nourish his soul as well as his body, and to bestow upon him some reproach seasoned with moralizing and advice, or a little commiseration, with an exhortation to conduct himself better in the future. My brother did not even ask him from what country he came, nor what was his history. For in his history there is a fault, and my brother seemed to avoid everything which could remind him of it. To such a point did he carry it, that at one time when my brother was speaking of the mountaineers of Pontalier, who exercise a gentle labour near heaven, and who, he added, are happy because they are innocent, he stopped short, fearing lest in this remark there might have escaped him something which might wound the man. By dint of reflection I think I have comprehended what was passing in my brother's heart. He was thinking, no doubt, that this man, whose name is Jean Vargin, had his misfortune only too vividly present in his mind, that the best thing was to divert him from it, and to make him believe, if only momentarily, that he was a person like any other, by treating him just in his ordinary way. Is not this indeed to understand charity well? Is there not, dear madame, something truly evangelical in this delicacy, which abstains from sermon, from moralizing, from allusions? And is not the truest pity when a man has a sore point not to touch it at all? It has seemed to me that this might have been my brother's private thought, in any case, what I can say is that, if he entertained all these ideas, he gave no sign of them. From beginning to end, even to me, he was the same as he is every evening, and he supped with this Jean Vangin with the same air and in the same manner in which he would have supped with Mr. Gideon le Provost, or with the curate of the parish. Towards the end, when he had reached the figs, there came a knock at the door. It was Mother Gerbeau, with her little one in her arms. My brother kissed the child on the brow and borrowed fifteen sous which I had about me to give to Mother Gerbeau. The man was not paying much heed to anything then. He was no longer talking, and he seemed very much fatigued. After poor old Gerbeau had taken her departure, my brother said grace. Then he turned to the man and said to him, You must be in great need of your bed. Madame Malois cleared the table very promptly. I understood that we must retire in order to allow this traveller to go to sleep and we both went upstairs. Nevertheless, I sent Madame Malois down a moment later to carry to the man's bed a goatskin from the black forest which was in my room. The nights are frigid, and that keeps one warm. It is a pity that this skin is old, all the hair is falling out. My brother bought it while he was in Germany at Tottlingen, near the sources of the Danube, as well as the little ivory-handled knife which I use at table. Madame Malois returned immediately. We said our prayers in the drawing-room, where we hang up the linen, and then we each retired to our own chambers, without saying a word to each other. Chapter 5 Tranquility After bidding his sister good night, Monsignor Bienvenu took one of the two silver candlesticks from the table, handed the other to his guest, and said to him, Monsieur, I will conduct you to your room. The man followed him. As might have been observed from what has been said above, the house was so arranged that in order to pass into the oratory where the alcove was situated, or to get out of it, it was necessary to traverse the bishop's bedroom. At the moment when he was crossing this apartment, Madame Malois was putting away the silverware in the cupboard near the head of the bed. This was her last care every evening before she went to bed. The bishop installed his guest in the alcove. A fresh white bed had been prepared there. The man set the candle down on a small table. Well, said the bishop, may you pass a good night. Tomorrow morning before you set out, you shall drink a cup of warm milk from our cows. Thanks, Monsieur l'abbé, said the man. Hardly had he pronounced these words full of peace, when all of a sudden, and without transition, he made a strange movement which would have frozen the two sainted women with horror had they witnessed it. Even at this day it is difficult for us to explain what inspired him at that moment. Did he intend to convey a warning or to throw out a menace? 
Was he simply obeying a sort of instinctive impulse, which was obscure even to himself? He turned abruptly to the old man, folded his arms, and bending upon his host a savage gaze, he exclaimed in a hoarse voice, Ah, really? You lodge me in your house, close to yourself, like this? He broke off and added with a laugh in which there lurked something monstrous. Have you really reflected well? How do you know that I have not been an assassin? The bishop replied, That is the concern of the good God. Then, gravely and moving his lips like one who is praying or talking to himself, he raised two fingers of his right hand and bestowed his benediction on the man, who did not bow, and without turning his head or looking behind him, he returned to his bedroom. When the alcove was in use, a large serge curtain drawn from wall to wall concealed the altar. The bishop knelt before this curtain as he passed and said a brief prayer. A moment later he was in his garden, walking, meditating, contemplating, his heart and soul wholly absorbed in those grand and mysterious things which God shows at night to the eyes which remain open. As for the man, he was actually so fatigued that he did not even profit by the nice white sheets. Snuffing out his candle with his nostrils after the manner of convicts, he dropped, all dressed as he was, upon the bed, where he immediately fell into a profound sleep. Midnight struck as the bishop returned from his garden to his apartment. A few minutes later, all were asleep in the little house. Chapter 6 Jean Valjean Towards the middle of the night, Jean Valjean awoke. Jean Valjean came from a poor peasant family of Brie. He had not learned to read in his childhood. When he reached man's estate, he became a tree pruner at Faverolles. His mother was named Jean Mathieu. His father was called Jean Valjean or Vlaljean, probably a soubriquet and a contraction of voilà Jean, here's Jean. Jean Valjean was of that thoughtful but not gloomy disposition which constitutes the peculiarity of affectionate natures. On the whole, however, there was something decidedly sluggish and insignificant about Jean Valjean, in appearance at least. He had lost his father and mother at a very early age. His mother had died of a milk fever which had not been properly attended to. His father, a tree pruner like himself, had been killed by a fall from a tree. All that remained to Jean Valjean was a sister older than himself. A widow with seven children, boys and girls, this sister had brought up Jean Valjean, and so long as she had a husband she lodged and fed her younger brother. The husband died. The eldest of the seven children was eight years old, the youngest one. Jean Valjean had just attained his twenty-fifth year. He took the father's place and, in his turn, supported the sister who had brought him up. This was done simply as a duty, and even a little churlishly on the part of Jean Valjean. Thus his youth had been spent in rude and ill-paid toil. He had never known a kind woman friend in his native parts. He had not had the time to fall in love. He returned at night weary, and ate his broth without uttering a word. His sister, Mother Jean, often took the best part of his repast from his bowl while he was eating. A bit of meat, a slice of bacon, the heart of the cabbage— to give to one of her children. As he went on eating, with his head bent over the table and almost into his soup, his long hair falling about his bowl and concealing his eyes, he had the air of perceiving nothing and allowing it. There was at Faverolles, not far from the Valjean thatched cottage, on the other side of the lane, a farmer's wife named Marie Claude. The Valjean children, habitually famished, sometimes went to borrow from Marie Claude a pint of milk, in their mother's name, which they drank behind a hedge or in some alley corner, snatching the jug from each other so hastily that the little girls spilled it on their aprons and down their necks. If their mother had known of this marauding, she would have punished the delinquents severely. Jean Valjean gruffly and grumblingly paid Marie Claude for the pint of milk behind their mother's back, and the children were not punished. In pruning season he earned eighteen sous a day, and then he hired out as a haymaker, as labourer, as neat herd on a farm, as a drudge. He did whatever he could. His sister worked also, but what could she do with seven little children? It was a sad group, enveloped in misery, which was being gradually annihilated. A very hard winter came. 
Jean had no work. The family had no bread, no bread literally. Seven children. One Sunday morning, Maubert Isabeau, the baker on the church square at Faverolles, was preparing to go to bed when he heard a violent blow on the grated front of his shop. He arrived in time to see an arm pass through a hole made by a blow from a fist, through the grating and the glass. The arm seized a loaf of bread and carried it off. Isabeau ran out in haste. The robber fled at the full speed of his legs. Isabeau ran after him and stopped him. The thief had flung away the loaf, but his arm was still bleeding. It was Jean Valjean. This took place in 1795. Jean Valjean was taken before the tribunals of the time for theft and breaking and entering an inhabited house at night. He had a gun which he used better than anyone else in the world. He was a bit of a poacher, and this injured his case. There exists a legitimate prejudice against poachers. The poacher, like the smuggler, smacks too strongly of the brigand. Nevertheless, we will remark cursorily, there is still an abyss between these races of men and the hideous assassin of the towns. The poacher lives in the forest, the smuggler lives in the mountains or on the sea. The cities make ferocious men because they make corrupt men. The mountain, the sea, the forest make savage men. They develop the fierce side, but often without destroying the humane side. Jean Valjean was pronounced guilty. The terms of the code were explicit. There occur formidable hours in our civilization. There are moments when the penal laws decree a shipwreck. What an ominous minute is it that in which society draws back and consummates the irreparable abandonment of a sentient being. Jean Valjean was condemned to five years in the galleys. On the 22nd of April, 1796, the victory of Montenotte, won by the general-in-chief of the Army of Italy, whom the message of the Directory to the 500 of the 2nd of Floriol, year 4, calls Buonaparte, was announced in Paris. On that same day, a great gang of galley slaves was put in chains at Bicet. Jean Valjean formed a part of that gang. An old turnkey of the prison, who is now nearly eighty years old, still recalls perfectly that unfortunate wretch who was chained to the end of the fourth line in the north angle of the courtyard. He was seated on the ground like the others. He did not seem to comprehend his position, except that it was horrible. It is probable that he also was disentangling from amid the vague ideas of a poor man, ignorant of everything, something excessive. While the bolt of his iron collar was being riveted behind his head with heavy blows from the hammer, he wept, his tears stifled him, they impeded his speech, he only managed to say from time to time, I was a tree pruner at Favarol. Then, still sobbing, he raised his right hand and lowered it gradually seven times, as though he were touching in succession seven heads of unequal heights, and from this gesture it was divine that the thing which he had done, whatever it was, he had done for the sake of clothing and nourishing seven little children. He set out for Toulon. He arrived there after a journey of twenty-seven days on a cart with a chain on his neck. At Toulon he was clothed in the red cassock. All that had constituted his life, even to his name, was effaced. He was no longer even Jean Valjean. He was number 24601. What became of his sister? What became of the seven children? Who troubled himself about that? What becomes of the handful of leaves from the young tree which is sawed off at the root? It is always the same story. These poor living beings, these creatures of God, henceforth without support, without guide, without refuge, wandered away at random, who, even knows, each in his own direction perhaps, and little by little buried themselves in that cold mist which engulfs solitary destinies, gloomy shades into which disappear in succession so many unlucky heads in the sombre march of the human race. They quitted the country. The clock tower of what had been their village forgot them. The boundary line of what had been their field forgot them. After a few years' residence in the galleys, Jean Valjean himself forgot them. In that heart, where there had been a wound, there was a scar. That is all. Only once during all the time which he spent at Toulon did he hear his sister mentioned. This happened, I think, towards the end of the fourth year of his captivity. I know not through what channels the news reached him. Someone who had known them in their own country had seen his sister. She was in Paris. She lived in a poor street, rear Saint-Sulpice, in the Rue de Gand. She had with her only one child, a little boy, the youngest. Where were the other six? 
Perhaps she did not know herself. Every morning she went to a printing office, number 3 Rue de Sabot, where she was a folder and stitcher. She was obliged to be there at six o'clock in the morning, long before daylight in winter. In the same building with the printing office there was a school, and to this school she took her little boy, who was seven years old. But as she entered the printing office at six, and the school only opened at seven, the child had to wait in the courtyard for the school to open for an hour, one hour of a winter night in the open air. They would not allow the child to come into the printing office because he was in the way, they said. When the workmen passed in the morning, they beheld this poor little being seated on the pavement, overcome with drowsiness, and often fast asleep in the shadow, crouched down and doubled up over his basket. When it rained, an old woman, the portress, took pity on him. She took him into her den, where there was a pallet, a spinning wheel, and two wooden chairs, and the little one slumbered in a corner, pressing himself close to the cat, that he might suffer less from cold. At seven o'clock the school opened and he entered. That is what was told to Jean Valjean. They talked to him about it for one day. It was a moment to flash as though a window had suddenly been opened upon the destiny of those things whom he had loved. Then all closed again. He heard nothing more for ever. Nothing from them ever reached him again. He never beheld them. He never met them again. And in the continuation of this mournful history, they will not be met with any more. Towards the end of this fourth year, Jean Valjean's turn to escape arrived. His comrades assisted him, as is the custom in that sad place. He escaped. He wandered for two days in the fields at liberty, if being at liberty is to be hunted, to turn the head every instant, to quake at the slightest noise, to be afraid of everything, of a smoking roof, of a passing man, of a barking dog, of a galloping horse, of a striking clock, of the day because one can see, of the night because one cannot see, of the highway, of the path, of a bush, of sleep. On the evening of the second day he was captured. He had neither eaten nor slept for thirty-six hours. The Maritime Tribunal condemned him for this crime to a prolongation of his term for three years, which made eight years. In the sixth year his turn to escape occurred again. He availed himself of it, but could not accomplish his flight fully. He was missing at roll call. The cannon were fired, and at night the patrol found him hidden under the keel of a vessel in the process of construction. He resisted the galley guards who seized him. Escape and rebellion. This case, provided for by a special code, was punished by an addition of five years, two of them in the double chain. Thirteen years. In the tenth year his turn came round again. He again profited by it. He succeeded no better. Three years for this fresh attempt. Sixteen years. Finally, I think it was during his thirteenth year, he made a last attempt— and only succeeded in getting retaken at the end of four hours of absence. Three years for those four hours. Nineteen years. In October 1815, he was released. He had entered there in 1796, for having broken a pane of glass and taken a loaf of bread. Room for a brief parenthesis. This is the second time during his studies on the penal question and damnation by law that the author of this book has come across the theft of a loaf of bread as the point of departure for the disaster of a destiny. Claude Gaux had stolen a loaf. Jean Valjean had stolen a loaf. English statistics prove the fact that four thefts out of five in London have hunger for their immediate cause. Jean Valjean had entered the galleys sobbing and shuddering. He emerged impassive. He had entered in despair. He emerged gloomy. What had taken place in that soul? Chapter 7 The Interior of Despair Let us try to say it. It is necessary that society should look at these things, because it is itself which creates them. He was, as we have said, an ignorant man, but he was not a fool. The light of nature was ignited in him. Unhappiness, which also possesses a clearness of a vision of its own, augmented the small amount of daylight which existed in this mind. Beneath the cudgel, beneath the chain, in the cell, in hardship, beneath the burning sun of the galleys, upon the plank bed of the convict, he withdrew into his own consciousness and meditated. He constituted himself the tribunal. 
he began by putting himself on trial. He recognized the fact that he was not an innocent man unjustly punished. He admitted that he had committed an extreme and blameworthy act, that that loaf of bread would probably not have been refused to him had he asked for it, that, in any case, it would have been better to wait until he could get it through compassion or through work, that it is not an unanswerable argument to say, can one wait when one is hungry? That, in the first place, it is very rare for anyone to die of hunger, literally, and next that, unfortunately or unfortunately, man is so constituted that he can suffer long and much, both morally and physically, without dying, that it is therefore necessary to have patience, that that would have been better for those poor little children, that it had been an act of madness for him, a miserable, unfortunate wretch, to take society at large violently by the collar, and to imagine that one can escape from misery through theft, that that is, in any case, a poor door through which to escape from misery, through which infamy enters, in short, that he was in the wrong. Then he asked himself, whether he had been the only one in fault, in his fatal history? Whether it was not a serious thing that he, a labourer out of work, that he, an industrious man, should have lacked bread? And whether the fault once committed and confessed, the chastisement had not been ferocious and disproportioned? Whether there had not been more abuse on the part of the law in respect to the penalty than there had been on the part of the culprit in respect to his fault? Whether there had not been an excess of weights in one balance of the scale, in the one which contains expiation? whether the overweight of the penalty was not equivalent to the annihilation of the crime, and did not result in reversing the situation of replacing the fault of the delinquent by the fault of the repression, of converting the guilty man into the victim and the debtor into the creditor, and of ranging the law definitely on the side of the man who had violated it. Whether this penalty, complicated by successive aggravations for attempts at escape, had not ended in becoming a sort of outrage perpetrated by the stronger upon the feebler, a crime of society against the individual, a crime which was being committed afresh every day, a crime which had lasted nineteen years. He asked himself whether human society could have the right to force its members to suffer equally in one case for its own unreasonable lack of foresight, and in the other case for its pitiless foresight, and to seize a poor man forever between a defect and an excess, a default of work, an excess of punishment. Whether it was not outrageous for society to treat thus precisely those of its members who were the least well endowed in the division of goods made by chance, and consequently the most deserving of consideration? These questions put and answered he judged society and condemned it. He condemned it to his hatred. He made it responsible for the fate which he was suffering, and he said to himself that it might be that one day he should not hesitate to call it to account. He declared to himself that there was no equilibrium between the harm which he had caused and the harm which was being done to him. He finally arrived at the conclusion that his punishment was not, in truth, unjust, but that it most assuredly was iniquitous. Anger may be both foolish and absurd. One can be irritated wrongfully. One is exasperated only when there is some show of right on one's side at bottom. Jean Valjean felt himself exasperated. And besides, human society had done him nothing but harm. He had never seen anything of it save that angry face which it calls justice, and which it shows to those whom it strikes. Med had only touched him to bruise him. Every contact with him had been a blow. Never since his infancy, since the days of his mother, of his sister, had he ever encountered a friendly word and a kindly face. From suffering to suffering he had gradually arrived at the conviction that life is a war, and that in this war he was the conquered. He had no other weapon than his hate. He resolved to wet it in the galleys and to bear it away with him when he departed. There was at Toulon a school for the convicts, kept by the Ignorantin friars, where the most necessary branches were taught to those of the unfortunate men who had a mind for them. He was of the number who had a mind. He went to school at the age of forty and learned to read, to write, to cipher. He felt that to fortify his intelligence was to fortify his hate. In certain cases, education and enlightenment can serve to eke out evil. There is a sad thing to say, 
after having judged society which had caused his unhappiness. He judged providence which had made society, and he condemned it also. Thus, during nineteen years of torture and slavery, this soul mounted and at the same time fell. Light entered it on one side and darkness on the other. Jean Valjean had not, as we have seen, an evil nature. He was still good when he arrived at the galleys. He there condemned society and felt that he was becoming wicked. He there condemned providence and was conscious that he was becoming impious. It is difficult not to indulge in meditation at this point. Does human nature thus change utterly and from top to bottom? Can the man created good by God be rendered wicked by man? Can the soul be completely made over by fate and become evil, fate being evil? Can the heart become misshapen and contract incurable deformities and infirmities under the oppression of a disproportionate unhappiness as the vertebral column beneath too low a vault? Is there not in every human soul, was there not in the soul of Jean Vangin in particular, a first spark, a divine element, incorruptible in this world, immortal in the other, which good can develop, fan, ignite, and make to glow with splendor, and which evil can never wholly extinguish? Grave and obscure questions, to the last of which every physiologist would probably have responded no, and that, without hesitation, had he beheld at Toulon, during the hours of repose, which were for Jean Vangin, Hours of reverie, this gloomy galley slave, seated with folded arms upon the bar of some capstan, with the end of his chain thrust into his pocket to prevent its dragging, serious, silent, and thoughtful, a pariah of the laws which regarded the man with wrath, condemned by civilization, and regarding heaven with severity. Certainly, and we make no attempt to dissimulate the fact, the observing physiologist would have beheld an irremediable misery. He would, perchance, have pitied this sick man of the law's making, but he would not have even essayed any treatment. He would have turned aside his gaze from the caverns of which he would have caught a glimpse within this soul, and, like Dante at the portals of hell, he would have effaced from this existence the word which the finger of God has, nevertheless, inscribed upon the brow of every man, hope. Was this state of his soul, which we have attempted to analyse, as perfectly clear to Jean Valjean as we have tried to render it for those who read us? Did Jean Valjean distinctly perceive after their formation, and had he seen distinctly during the process of their formation, all the elements of which his moral misery was composed? Had this rough and unlettered man gathered a perfectly clear perception of the succession of ideas through which he had by degrees mounted and descended to the lugubrious aspects which had, for so many years, formed the inner horizon of his spirit? Was he conscious of all that passed within him, and of all that was working there? That is something which we do not presume to state. It is something which we do not even believe. There was too much ignorance in Jean Valjean, even after his misfortune, to prevent much vagueness from still lingering there. At times he did not rightly know himself what he felt. Jean Valjean was in the shadows, he suffered in the shadows, he hated in the shadows, one might have said that he hated in advance of himself. He dwelt habitually in this shadow, feeling his way like a blind man and a dreamer. Only at intervals there suddenly came to him, from without and from within, an access of wrath, a surcharge of suffering, a livid and rapid flash which illuminated his whole soul and caused to appear abruptly all around him, in front, behind, amid the gleams of a frightful light, the hideous precipices, and the sombre perspective of his destiny. The flash passed, the night closed in again, and where was he? He no longer knew. The peculiarity of pains of this nature, in which that which is pitiless, that is to say, that which is brutalizing, predominates, is to transform a man little by little, by a sort of stupid transfiguration, into a wild beast, sometimes into a ferocious beast. Jean Valjean's successive and obstinate attempts at escape would alone suffice to prove this strange working of the law upon the human soul. Jean Valjean would have renewed these attempts, utterly useless and foolish as they were, as often as the opportunity had presented itself, without reflecting for an instant on the result, nor on the experiences which he had already gone through. He escaped impetuously, like the wolf who finds his cage open. Instinct said to him, flee, reason would have said, remain but in the presence of so violent a temptation, reason vanished, nothing remained but instinct. The beast alone acted. 
When he was recaptured, the fresh severities inflicted on him only served to render him still more wild. One detail which we must not omit is that he possessed a physical strength which was not approached by a single one of the denizens of the galleys. At work, at paying out a cable or winding up a capstan, Jean Valjean was worth four men. He sometimes lifted and sustained enormous weights on his back, and when the occasion demanded it, he replaced that implement which is called a jack-screw, and was formerly called orgoy, pride, whence we may remark in passing is derived the name of the rue Montegoy, near the Halle fish market in Paris. His comrades had nicknamed him Jean the Jack-screw. Once, when they were repairing the balcony of the town hall at Toulon, one of those admirable caryatids of Pouget, which support the balcony, became loosened, and was on the point of falling. Jean Valjean, who was present, supported the caryatid with his shoulder, and gave the workmen time to arrive. His suppleness even exceeded his strength. Certain convicts who were forever dreaming of escape ended by making a veritable science of force and skill combined. It is the science of muscles. An entire system of mysterious statics is daily practised by prisoners, men who are forever envious of the flies and birds. To climb a vertical surface and to find points of support where hardly a projection was visible was play to Jean Valjean. An angle of the wall being given, with the tension of his back and legs, with his elbows and his heels fitted into the unevenness of the stone, he raised himself as if by magic to the third story. He sometimes mounted thus even to the roof of the galley prison. He spoke but little. He laughed not at all. An excessive emotion was required to wring from him once or twice a year that lugubrious laugh of the convict, which is like the echo of the laugh of a demon. To all appearance he seemed to be occupied in the constant contemplation of something terrible. He was absorbed, in fact. Athwart the unhealthy perceptions of an incomplete nature and a crushed intelligence, he was confusedly conscious that some monstrous thing was resting on him. In that obscure and one shadow within which he crawled, each time that he turned his neck and essayed to raise his glance, he perceived with terror mingled with rage a sort of frightful accumulation of things collecting and mounting above him, beyond the range of his vision, laws, prejudices, men and deeds, whose outlines escaped him, whose mass terrified him, and which was nothing else than that prodigious pyramid which we call civilization. He distinguished here and there in that swarming and formless mass, now near him, now afar off, and on inaccessible table-lands, some group, some detail, vividly illuminated, here the galley sergeant and his cudgel, there the gendarme and his sword, yonder the mitred archbishop, away at the top like a sort of sun the emperor, crowned and dazzling. It seemed to him that these distant splendours, far from dissipating his night, rendered it more funereal and more black. All this, laws, prejudices, deeds, men, things, went and came above him, over his head, in accordance with the complicated and mysterious movement which God imparts to civilization, walking over him and crushing him, with I know not what peacefulness, in its cruelty and inexorability, in its indifference. Souls which have fallen to the bottom of all possible misfortune, unhappy men lost in the lowest of those limbos at which no one any longer looks, the reproved of the law, feel the whole weight of this human society so formidable for him who is without, so frightful for him who is beneath, resting upon their heads. In this situation Jean Valjean meditated, and what could be the nature of his meditation? If the grain of millet beneath the millstone had thoughts, it would, doubtless, think that same thing which Jean Valjean thought. All these things, realities full of spectres, phantasmographies full of realities, had eventually created for him a sort of interior state which is almost indescribable. At times, amid his convict toil, he paused. He fell to thinking. His reason, at one and the same time riper and more troubled than of yore, rose in revolt. Everything which had happened to him seemed to him absurd, everything that surrounded him seemed to him impossible. He said to himself, It is a dream. He gazed at the galley sergeant standing a few paces from him. The galley sergeant seemed a phantom to him. All of a sudden the phantom dealt him a blow with his cudgel. Visible nature hardly existed for him. It would almost be true to say that there existed for Jean Valjean neither sun nor fine summer days, nor radiant sky nor fresh April dawns. 
I know not what vent hole daylight habitually illumined his soul. To sum up, in conclusion, that which can be summed up and translated into positive results in all that we have just pointed out, we will confine ourselves to the statement that in the course of nineteen years, Jean Valjean, the inoffensive tree pruner of Faverolles, the formidable convict of Toulon, had become capable, thanks to the manner in which the galleys had moulded him, of two sorts of evil action. Firstly, of evil action which was rapid, unpremeditated, dashing, entirely instinctive, in the nature of reprisals for the evil which he had undergone. Secondly, of evil action which was serious, grave, consciously argued out and premeditated, with the false ideas which such a misfortune can furnish. His deliberate deeds pass through three successive phases, which natures of a certain stamp can alone traverse. Reasoning, will, perseverance. He had for moving causes his habitual wrath, bitterness of soul, a profound sense of indignity suffered, the reaction even against the good, the innocent and the just, if there are any such. The point of departure, like the point of arrival, for all his thoughts, was hatred of human law, that hatred which, if it be not arrested in its development by some providential incident, becomes within a given time the hatred of society, then the hatred of the human race, then the hatred of creation, and which manifests itself by a vague, incessant, and brutal desire to do harm to some living being, no matter whom. It will be perceived that it was not without reason that Jean Valjean's passport described him as a very dangerous man. From year to year this soul had dried away slowly, but with fatal sureness. When the heart is dry, the eye is dry. On his departure from the galleys, it had been nineteen years since he had shed a tear. Chapter 8 Billows and Shadows A man overboard. What matters it? The vessel does not halt. The wind blows. That sombre ship has a path which it is forced to pursue. It passes on. The man disappears, then reappears. He plunges, he rises again to the surface. He calls, he stretches out his arms. He is not heard. The vessel, trembling under the hurricane, is wholly absorbed in its own workings. The passengers and sailors do not even see the drowning man. His miserable head is but a speck amid the immensity of the waves. He gives vent to desperate cries from out of the depths. What a spectre is that retreating sail! He gazes and gazes at it frantically. It retreats, it grows dim, it diminishes in size. He was there but just now. He was one of the crew. He went and came along the deck with the rest. He had his part of breath and of sunlight. He was a living man. Now what has taken place? He has slipped. He has fallen. All is at an end. He is in the tremendous sea. Underfoot he has nothing but what flees and crumbles. The billows, torn and lashed by the wind, encompass him hideously. The tossings of the abyss bear him away. All the tongues of water dash over his head. A populace of waves spits upon him. Confused openings half devour him. Every time that he sinks he catches glimpses of precipices filled with night. Frightful and unknown vegetation seize him, not about his feet, draw him to them. He is conscious that he is becoming an abyss, that he forms part of the foam. The waves toss him from one to another. He drinks in the bitterness. The cowardly ocean attacks him furiously to drown him. The enormity plays with his agony. It seems as though all that water were hate. Nevertheless, he struggles. He tries to defend himself. He tries to sustain himself. He makes an effort. He swims. He, his pretty strength all exhausted, instantly combats the inexhaustible. Where then is the ship? Yonder barely visible in the pale shadows of the horizon. The wind blows in gusts, all the foam overwhelms him. He raises his eyes and beholds only the lividness of the clouds. He witnesses, amid his death pangs, the immense madness of the sea. He is tortured by this madness, he hears noises strange to man, which seem to come from beyond the limits of the earth, and from one knows not what frightful region beyond. There are birds in the clouds, just as there are angels above human distresses. But what can they do for him? 
They sing and fly and float, and he, he rattles in the death agony. He feels himself buried in those two infinities, the ocean and the sky, at one and the same time. The one is a tomb, the other is a shroud. Night descends. He has been swimming for hours. His strength is exhausted. That ship, that distant thing in which there were men, has vanished. He is alone in the formidable twilight gulf. He sinks, he stiffens himself, he twists himself, he feels under him the monstrous billows of the invisible. He shouts, There are no more men. Where is God? He shouts, Help! Help! He still shouts on. Nothing on the horizon, nothing in heaven. He implores the expanse, the waves, the seaweed, the reef. They are deaf. He beseeches the tempest. The imperturbable tempest obeys only the infinite. Around him darkness, fog, solitude, the stormy and non-sentient tumult, the undefined curling of those wild waters. In him horror and fatigue, beneath him the depths. Not a point of support, he thinks of the gloomy adventures of the corpse in the limitless shadow. The bottomless cold paralyzes him. His hands contract convulsively. They close and grasp nothingness. Winds, clouds, whirlwinds, gusts, useless stars, what is to be done? The desperate man gives up. He is weary. He chooses the alternative of death. He resists not. He lets himself go. He abandons his grip, and then he tosses forevermore in the lugubrious, dreary depths of engulfment. O oh, implacable march of human societies! O oh, losses of men and of souls on the way! Ocean into which falls all that the law lets slip! Disastrous absence of help! O oh, moral death! The sea is the inexorable social night into which the personal laws fling their condemned. The sea is the immensity of wretchedness. The soul going downstream in this gulf may become a corpse. Who shall resuscitate it? Chapter 9 New Troubles When the hour came for him to take his departure from the galleys, when Jean Valjean heard in his ear the strange words, Thou art free, the moment seemed improbable and unprecedented. A ray of vivid light, a ray of the true light of the living, suddenly penetrated within him. But it was not long before this ray paled. Jean Valjean had been dazzled by the idea of liberty. He had believed in a new life. He very speedily perceived what sort of liberty it is to which a yellow passport is provided and this was encompassed with much bitterness. He had calculated that his earnings, during his sojourn in the galleys, ought to amount to a hundred and seventy-one francs. It is but just to add that he had forgotten to include in his calculations the forced repose of Sundays and festival days during nineteen years, which entailed a diminution of about eighty francs. At all events, his hoard had been reduced by various local levies to the sum of one hundred and nine francs, fifteen sous, which had been counted out to him on his departure. He had thought nothing of this, and had thought himself wronged. Let us say the word, robbed. On the day following his liberation, he saw at Grasse, in front of an orange flower distillery, some men engaged in unloading bales. He offered his services. Business was pressing, they were accepted. He set to work. He was intelligent, robust, adroit, he did his best, the master seemed pleased. While he was at work, a gendarme passed, observed him and demanded his papers. It was necessary to show him the yellow passport. That done, Jean Valjean resumed his labour. A little while before, he had questioned one of the workmen as to the amount which they earned each day at this occupation. He had been told thirty sous. When evening arrived, as he was forced to set out again on the following day, he presented himself to the owner of the distillery and requested to be paid. The owner did not utter a word, but handed him fifteen sous. He objected. He was told, That is enough for thee. He persisted. The master looked him straight between the eyes and said to him, Beware of the prison. There again he considered that he had been robbed. Society, the state, by diminishing his hoard, had robbed him wholesale. Now it was the individual who was robbing him at retail. Liberation is not deliverance. One gets free from the galleys, but not from the sentence. This is what happened to him at Grasse, 
we have seen in what manner he was received at thee. Chapter 10 The Man Aroused As the cathedral clock struck two in the morning, Jean Valjean awoke. What woke him was that his bed was too good. It was nearly twenty years since he had slept in a bed, and, although he had not undressed, the sensation was too novel not to disturb his slumbers. He had slept more than four hours. His fatigue had passed away. He was accustomed not to devote many hours to repose. He opened his eyes and stared into the gloom which surrounded him. Then he closed them again with the intention of going to sleep once more. When many varied sensations have agitated the day, when various matters preoccupy the mind, one falls asleep once, but not a second time. Sleep comes more easily than it returns. This is what happened to Jean Valjean. He could not get to sleep again, and he fell to thinking. He was at one of those moments when the thoughts which one has in one's mind are troubled. There was a sort of dark confusion in his brain, his memories of the olden time and of the immediate present floated there pell-mell and mingled confusedly, losing their proper forms, becoming disproportionately large, then suddenly disappearing as in a muddy and perturbed pool. Many thoughts occurred to him, but there was one which kept constantly presenting itself afresh and which drove away all others. We will mention this thought at once. He had observed the six sets of silver forks and spoons, and the ladle which Madame Malois had placed on the table. Those six sets of silver haunted him. They were there, a few paces distant, just as he was traversing the adjoining room to reach the one in which he then was. The old servant woman had been in the act of placing them in a little cupboard near the head of the bed. He had taken careful note of this cupboard. On the right, as you entered from the dining room, they were solid and old silver. From the ladle one could get at least two hundred francs, double what he had earned in nineteen years. It is true that he would have earned more if the administration had not robbed him. His mind wavered for a whole hour in fluctuations, with which there was certainly mingled some struggle. Three o'clock struck. He opened his eyes again, drew himself up abruptly into a sitting posture, stretched out his arm and felt of his knapsack which he had thrown down on a corner of the alcove. Then he hung his legs over the edge of the bed and placed his feet on the floor and thus found himself, almost without knowing it, seated on his bed. He remained for a time thoughtfully in this attitude, which would have been suggestive of something sinister for anyone who had seen him thus in the dark, the only person awake in that house where all were sleeping. All of a sudden he stooped down, removed his shoes and placed them softly on the mat beside the bed, then he resumed his thoughtful attitude and became motionless once more. Throughout this hideous meditation, the thoughts which we have above indicated moved incessantly through his brain, entered, withdrew, re-entered, and in a manner oppressed him, and then he thought also, without knowing why, and with the mechanical persistence of reverie of a convict named Brevert, whom he had known in the galleys, and whose trousers had been held up by a single suspender of knitted cotton. The chequered pattern of that suspender recurred incessantly to his mind. He remained in this situation, and would have so remained indefinitely even until daybreak, had not the clock struck one, the half or quarter hour. It seemed to him that that stroke said to him, Come on. He rose to his feet, hesitated still another moment, and listened. All was quiet in the house, then he walked straight ahead, with short steps to the window of which he caught a glimpse. The night was not very dark. There was a full moon, across which coursed large clouds driven by the wind. This created outdoors, alternate shadow and gleams of light, eclipses, then bright openings of the clouds, and indoors a sort of twilight. This twilight, sufficient to enable a person to see his way, intermittent on account of the clouds, resembled the sort of livid light which falls through an air hole in a cellar, before which the passer-by come and go. On arriving at the window, Jean Valjean examined it. It had no grating. It opened in the garden and was fastened, according to the fashion of the country, only by a small pin. He opened it, but as a rush of cold and piercing air penetrated the room abruptly, he closed it again immediately. He scrutinized the garden with that attentive gaze which studies rather than looks. 
The garden was enclosed by a tolerably low white wall, easy to climb. Far away at the extremity he perceived tops of trees, spaced at regular intervals, which indicated that the wall separated the garden from an avenue or lane planted with trees. Having taken this survey, he executed a movement like that of a man who has made up his mind, strode to his alcove, grasped his knapsack, opened it, fumbled in it, pulled out of it something which he placed on the bed, put his shoes into one of his pockets, shut the whole thing up again, threw the knapsack on his shoulders, put on his cap, drew the visor down over his eyes, felt for his cudgel, went and placed it in the angle of the window, then returned to the bed and resolutely seized the object which he had deposited there. It resembled a short bar of iron, pointed like a pike at one end. It would have been difficult to distinguish in that darkness for what employment that bit of iron could have been designed. Perhaps it was a lever, possibly it was a club. In the daytime it would have been possible to recognise it as nothing more than a miner's candlestick. Convicts were, at that period, sometimes employed in carrying stone from the lofty hills which environ Toulon, and it was not rare for them to have miner's tools at their command. These miners' candlesticks are of massive iron, terminated at the lower extremity by a point, by means of which they are stuck into the rock. He took the candlestick in his right hand, holding his breath and trying to deaden the sound of his tread. He directed his steps to the door of the adjoining room, occupied by the bishop, as we already know. On arriving at this door, he found it ajar. The bishop had not closed it. Chapter 11 What He Does Jean Valjean listened. Not a sound. He gave the door a push. He pushed it gently with the tip of his finger, lightly with the furtive and uneasy gentleness of a cat which is desirous of entering. The door yielded to this pressure and made an imperceptible and silent movement which enlarged the opening a little. He waited a moment, then gave the door a second and a bolder push. It continued to yield in silence. The opening was now large enough to allow him to pass, but near the door there stood a little table which formed an embarrassing angle with it and barred the entrance. Jean Valjean recognized the difficulty. It was necessary at any cost to enlarge the aperture still further. He decided on his course of action and gave the door a third push, more energetic than the two preceding. This time a badly oiled hinge suddenly emitted amid the silence a hoarse and prolonged cry. Jean Valjean shuddered. The noise of the hinge rang in his ears with something of the piercing and formidable sound of the trump of the Day of Judgment. In the fantastic exaggerations of the first moment, he almost imagined that the hinge had just become animated and had suddenly assumed a terrible life and that it was barking like a dog to arouse everyone and warn and to wake those who were asleep. He halted, shuddering, bewildered, and fell back from the tips of his toes upon his heels. He heard the arteries in his temples beating like two forge hammers, and it seemed to him that his breath issued from his breast with the roar of the wind issuing from a cavern. It seemed impossible to him that the horrible clamour of that irritated hinge should not have disturbed the entire household like the shock of an earthquake. The door, pushed by him, had taken the alarm and had shouted. The old man would rise at once. The two old women would shriek out. People would come to their assistance. In less than a quarter of an hour, the town would be in an uproar, and the gendarmerie on hand. For a moment he thought himself lost. He remained where he was, petrified, like the statue of salt, not daring to make a movement. Several minutes elapsed. The door had fallen wide open. He ventured to peep into the next room. Nothing had stirred there. He lent an ear. Nothing was moving in the house. The noise made by the rusty hinge had not awakened anyone. This first danger was past, but there still reigned a frightful tumult within him. Nevertheless, he did not retreat. Even when he had thought himself lost, he had not drawn back. His only thought now was to finish as soon as possible. He took a step and entered the room. This room was in a state of perfect calm. Here and there vague and confused forms were distinguishable, which in the daylight were papers scattered on a table, open folios, volumes piled upon a stool, an armchair heaped with clothing, a prie-dieu, 
and which at that hour were only shadowy corners and whitish spots. Jean Valjean advanced with precaution, taking care not to knock against the furniture. He could hear, at the extremity of the room, the even and tranquil breathing of the sleeping bishop. He suddenly came to a halt. He was near the bed. He had arrived there sooner than he had thought for. Nature sometimes mingles her effects and her spectacles with our actions with sombre and intelligent appropriateness, as though she desired to make us reflect. For the last half hour a large cloud had covered the heavens. At the moment when Jean Valjean paused in front of the bed, this cloud parted, as though on purpose, and a ray of light traversing the long window suddenly illuminated the bishop's pale face. He was sleeping peacefully. He lay in his bed almost completely dressed, on account of the cold of the Basse Alps, in a garment of brown wool which covered his arms to the wrists. His head was thrown back on the pillow in the careless attitude of repose. His hand, adorned with the pastoral ring, and whence had fallen so many good deeds and so many holy actions, was hanging over the edge of the bed. His whole face was illumined with a vague expression of satisfaction, of hope, and of felicity. It was more than a smile, and almost a radiance. He bore upon his brow the indescribable reflection of a light which was invisible. The soul of the just contemplates in sleep a mysterious heaven. A reflection of that heaven rested on the bishop. It was, at the same time, a luminous transparency, for that heaven was within him. That heaven was his conscience. At the moment when the ray of moonlight superposed itself, so to speak, upon the inward radiance, the sleeping bishop seemed as in a glory. It remained, however, gentle and veiled in an ineffable half-light. That moon in the sky, that slumbering nature, that garden without a quiver, that house which was so calm, the hour, the moment, the silence, added some solemn and unspeakable quality to the venerable repose of this man, and enveloped in a sort of serene and majestic aureole that white hair, those closed eyes, that face in which all was hope and all was confidence, that head of an old man and that slumber of an infant. There was something almost divine in this man, who was thus august, without being himself aware of it. Jean Valjean was in the shadow and stood motionless with his iron candlestick in his hand, frightened by this luminous old man. Never had he beheld anything like this. This confidence terrified him. The moral world has no grander spectacle than this. A troubled and uneasy conscience, which has arrived on the brink of an evil action, contemplating the slumber of the just. That slumber, in that isolation, and with a neighbour like himself, had about it something sublime, of which he was vaguely but imperiously conscious. No one could have told what was passing within him, not even himself. In order to attempt to form an idea of it, it is necessary to think of the most violent of things in the presence of the most gentle. Even on his visage, it would have been impossible to distinguish anything with certainty. It was a sort of haggard astonishment. He gazed at it, and that was all. But what was his thought? It would have been impossible to divine it. What was evident was that he was touched and astounded. But what was the nature of this emotion? His eye never quitted the old man. The only thing which was clearly to be inferred from his attitude and his physiognomy was a strange indecision. One would have said that he was hesitating between the two abysses, the one in which one loses oneself and that in which one saves oneself. He seemed prepared to crush that skull or to kiss that hand. At the expiration of a few minutes his left arm rose slowly towards his brow and he took off his cap. Then his arm fell back with the same deliberation, and Jean Valjean fell to meditating once more, his cap in his left hand, his club in his right hand, his hair bristling all over his savage head. The bishop continued to sleep in profound peace beneath that terrifying gaze. The gleam of the moon rendered confusedly visible the crucifix over the chimney-piece, which seemed to be extending its arms to both of them with a benediction for one and pardon for the other. Suddenly Jean Valjean replaced his cap on his brow, then stepped rapidly past the bed, without glancing at the bishop straight to the cupboard which he saw near the head. He raised his iron candlestick as though to force the lock. The key was there. He opened it. The first thing which presented itself to him was the basket of silverware. 
he seized it, traversed the chamber with long strides, without taking any precautions and without troubling himself about the noise, gained the door, re-entered the oratory, opened the window, seized his cudgel, bestrode the window sill of the ground floor, put the silver into his knapsack, threw away the basket, crossed the garden, leapt over the wall like a tiger, and fled. Chapter 12 The Bishop Works The next morning at sunrise, Monsignor Bienvenu was strolling in his garden. Madame Malois ran up to him in utter consternation. Monsignor, Monsignor, she exclaimed, does your grace know where the basket of silver is? Yes, replied the bishop. Jesus the Lord be blessed, she resumed. I did not know what had become of it. The bishop had just picked up the basket in a flower bed. He presented it to Madame Malois. Here it is. Well, said she, nothing in it, and the silver? Ah, returned the bishop. So it is the silver which troubles you. I don't know where it is. Great, good God, it is stolen. That man who was here last night has stolen it. In a twinkling, with all the vivacity of an alert old woman, Madame Malois had rushed to the oratory, entered the alcove, and returned to the bishop. The bishop had just bent down and was sighing as he examined a plant of Cochleria de Guillon, which the basket had broken as it fell across the bed. He rose up at Madame Malois's cry. Monseigneur, the man is gone. The silver has been stolen. As she uttered this exclamation, her eyes fell upon a corner of the garden where traces of the wall having been scaled were visible. The coping of the wall had been torn away. Stay, yonder is the way he went. He jumped over into Cochefile Lane. Ah, oh, the abomination, he has stolen our silver. The bishop remained silent for a moment. Then he raised his grave eyes and said gently to Madame Malois, and in the first place was that silver ours. Madame Malois was speechless. Another silence ensued, then the bishop went on. Madame Malois, I have for a long time detained that silver wrongfully. It belonged to the poor. Who was that man? A poor man, evidently. Alas, Jesus, returned Madame Malois. It is not for my sake, nor for Mademoiselle's. It makes no difference to us, but it is for the sake of Monseigneur. What is Monseigneur to eat with now? The bishop gazed at her with an air of amazement. Ah, come, are there no such things as pewter forks and spoons? Madame Malois shrugged her shoulders. Pewter has an odour. Iron forks and spoons, then. Madame Malois made an expressive grimace. Iron has a taste. Very well, said the bishop. Wooden ones, then. A few moments later he was breakfasting at the very table at which Jean Valjean had sat on the previous evening. As he ate his breakfast, Monsignor Welcome remarked gaily to his sister, who said nothing, and to Madame Malois, who was grumbling under her breath, that one really does not need either fork or spoon even of wood in order to dip a bit of bread in a cup of milk. A pretty idea, truly, said Madame Malois to herself, and as she went and came, to take in a man like that and to lodge him close to oneself, and how fortunate that he did nothing but steal. Ah, mon Dieu, it makes one shudder to think of it. As the brother and sister were about to rise from the table, there came a knock at the door. Come in, said the bishop. The door opened. A singular and violent group made its appearance on the threshold. Three men were holding a fourth man by the collar. The three men were gendarmes, the other was Jean Valjean. A brigadier of gendarmes, who seemed to be in command of the group, was standing near the door. He entered and advanced to the bishop, making a military salute. Monseigneur, said he. At this word, Jean Valjean, who was dejected and seemed overwhelmed, raised his head with an air of stupefaction. Monseigneur, he murmured. So he is not the cure. Silence, said the gendarme. He is Monseigneur the bishop. In the meantime, Monseigneur Bienvenu had advanced as quickly as his great age permitted. Ah, here you are, he exclaimed, looking at Jean Valjean. I am glad to see you. Well, but how is this? I gave you the candlesticks, too, which are of silver like the rest, and for which you can certainly get two hundred francs. Why did you not carry them away with your forks and spoons? Jean Valjean opened his eyes wide, 
and stared at the venerable bishop with an expression which no human tongue can render any account of. Monseigneur, said the brigadier of gendarmes, so what this man said is true, then? We came across him. He was walking like a man who is running away. We stopped him to look into the matter. He had this silver. And he told you, interposed the bishop with a smile, that it had been given to him by a kind old fellow of a priest with whom he had passed the night. I see how the matter stands. And you have brought him back here. It is a mistake. In that case, replied the brigadier, we can let him go? Certainly, replied the bishop. The gendarmes released Jean Valjean, who recoiled. Is it true that I am to be released? He said in an almost inarticulate voice, and as though he were talking in his sleep. Yes, thou art released. Dost thou not understand? said one of the gendarmes. My friend, resumed the bishop, before you go, here are your candlesticks. Take them. He stepped up to the chimney piece, took the two silver candlesticks, and brought them to Jean Valjean. The two women looked on without uttering a word, without a gesture, without a look which could disconcert the bishop. Jean Valjean was trembling in every limb. He took the two candlesticks mechanically and with a bewildered air. Now, said the bishop, go in peace. By the way, when you return, my friend, it is not necessary to pass through the garden. You can always enter and depart through the street door. It is never fastened with anything but a latch, either by day or by night. Then, turning to the gendarmes, You may retire, gentlemen. The gendarmes retired. Jean Valjean was like a man on the point of fainting. The bishop drew near to him and said in a low voice, Do not forget, never forget, that you have promised to use this money in becoming an honest man. Jean Valjean, who had no recollection of ever having promised anything, remained speechless. The bishop had emphasized the words when he uttered them. He resumed with solemnity. Jean Valjean, my brother, you no longer belong to evil but to good. It is your soul that I buy from you. I withdraw it from black thoughts and the spirit of perdition, and I give it to God. Chapter 13 Little Gervais Jean Valjean left the town as though he were fleeing from it. He set out at a very hasty pace through the fields, taking whatever roads and paths presented themselves to him without perceiving that he was incessantly retracing his steps. He wandered thus the whole morning without having eaten anything and without feeling hungry. He was the prey of a throng of novel sensations. He was conscious of a sort of rage. He did not know against whom it was directed. He could not have told whether he was touched or humiliated. There came over him at moments a strange emotion which he resisted and to which he opposed the hardness acquired during the last twenty years of his life. This state of mind fatigued him. He perceived with dismay that the sort of frightful calm which the injustice of his misfortune had conferred upon him was giving way within him. He asked himself what would replace this. At times he would have actually preferred to be in prison with the gendarmes, and that things should not have happened in this way. It would have agitated him less. Although the season was tolerably far advanced, there were still a few late flowers in the hedgerows here and there, whose odour as he passed through them in his march recalled to him memories of his childhood. These memories were almost intolerable to him. It was so long since they had recurred to him, unutterable thoughts assembled within him in this manner all day long. As the sun declined to its setting, casting long shadows athwart the soil from every pebble, Jean Valjean sat down behind a bush upon a large ruddy plain which was absolutely deserted. There was nothing on the horizon except the Alps, not even the spire of a distant village. Jean Valjean might have been three leagues distance from D. A path, which intersected the plain, passed a few paces from the bush. In the middle of this meditation, which would have contributed not a little to render his rags terrifying to anyone who might have encountered him, a joyous sound became audible. He turned his head and saw a little Savoyard, about ten years of age, coming up the path and singing, his hurdy-gurdy on his hip and his marmot-box on his back. 
one of those gay and gentle children who go from land to land affording a view of their knees through the holes in their trousers. Without stopping his song, the lad halted in his march from time to time and played at knuckle-bones with some coins which he had in his hand, his whole fortune probably. Among this money there was one forty-sou piece. The child halted beside the bush without perceiving Jean Valjean and tossed up his handful of sous, which up to that time he had caught with a good deal of adroitness on the back of his hand. This time the forty-sou piece escaped him and went rolling towards the brushwood until it reached Jean Valjean. Jean Valjean set his foot upon it. In the meantime the child had looked after his coin and had caught sight of him. He showed no astonishment but walked straight up to the man. The spot was absolutely solitary. As far as the eye could see, there was not a person on the plain or on the path. The only sound was the tiny, feeble cries of a flock of birds of passage, which was traversing the heavens at an immense height. The child was standing with his back to the sun, which cast threads of gold in his hair, and empurpled with its blood-red gleam the savage face of Jean Valjean. Sir, said the little Savoyard, with that childish confidence which is composed of ignorance and innocence, my money. What is your name? said Jean Valjean. Little Gervais, sir. Go away, said Jean Valjean. Sir, resumed the child, give me back my money. Jean Valjean dropped his head and made no reply. The child began again. My money, sir. Jean Valjean's eyes remained fixed on the earth. My piece of money! cried the child, my white piece, my silver. It seemed as though Jean Valjean did not hear him. The child grasped him by the collar of his blouse and shook him. At the same time he made an effort to displace the big iron-shod shoe which rested on his treasure. I want my piece of money, my piece of forty sous. The child wept. Jean Valjean raised his head. He still remained seated. His eyes were troubled. He gazed at the child in a sort of amazement, then he stretched out his hand towards his cudgel and cried in a terrible voice, Who's there? I, sir, replied the child, little Gervais, I, give me back my forty sous, if you please. Take your foot away, sir, if you please. Then, irritated, though he was so small and becoming almost menacing, Come now, will you take your foot away? Take your foot away, or we'll see. Ah, it's still you, said Jean Valjean, and raising abruptly to his feet, his foot still resting on the silver piece, he added, Will you take yourself off? The frightened child looked at him, then began to tremble, from head to foot, and, after a few moments of stupor, he set out, running at the top of his speed, without daring to turn his neck or to utter a cry. Nevertheless, lack of breath forced him to halt after a certain distance, and Jean Valjean heard him sobbing in the midst of his own reverie. At the end of a few moments the child had disappeared. The sun had set. The shadows were descending around Jean Valjean. He had eaten nothing all day. It is probable that he was feverish. He had remained standing and had not changed his attitude after the child's flight. The breath heaved his chest at long and irregular intervals. His gaze, fixed ten or twelve paces in front of him, seemed to be scrutinizing with profound attention the shape of an ancient fragment of blue earthenware which had fallen in the grass. All at once he shivered. He had just begun to feel the chill of evening. He settled his cap more firmly on his brow, sought mechanically to cross and button his blouse, advanced a step and stopped to pick up his cudgel. At that moment he caught sight of the forty-sou piece which his foot had half ground into the earth, and which was shining among the pebbles. It was as though he had received a galvanic shock. What is this? he muttered between his teeth. He recoiled three paces, then halted, without being able to detach his gaze from the spot which his foot had trodden but an instant before, as though the thing which lay glittering there in the gloom had been an open eye riveted upon him. At the expiration of a few moments he darted convulsively towards the silver coin, seized it, and straightened himself up again and began to gaze afar off over the plain, at the same time casting his eyes towards all points of the horizon. As he stood there erect and shivering, like a terrified wild animal which is seeking refuge. 
He saw nothing. Night was falling, the plain was cold and vague, great banks of violet haze were rising in the gleam of the twilight. He said, Ah, and set out rapidly in the direction in which the child had disappeared. After about thirty paces he paused, looked about him and saw nothing. Then he shouted with all his might, Little Gervais, little Gervais. He paused and waited. There was no reply. The landscape was gloomy and deserted. He was encompassed by space. There was nothing around him but an obscurity in which his gaze was lost and a silence which engulfed his voice. An icy north wind was blowing and imparted to things around him a sort of lugubrious life. The bushes shook their thin little arms with incredible fury. One would have said that they were threatening and pursuing someone. He set out on his march again, then he began to run, and from time to time he halted and shouted into that solitude with a voice which was the most formidable and the most disconsolate that it was possible to hear. Little Gervais, little Gervais. Assuredly, if the child had heard him, he would have been alarmed and would have taken good care not to show himself. But the child was no doubt already far away. He encountered a priest on horseback. He stepped up to him and said, Monsieur le Cure, have you seen a child pass? No, said the priest, one named Little Gervais. I have seen no one. He drew two five-franc pieces from his money bag and handed them to the priest. Monsieur le Cure, this is for your poor people. Monsieur le Cure, he was a little lad, about ten years old, with a marmot, I think, and a hurdy-gurdy, one of those Savoyards, you know? I have not seen him. Little Gervais? There are no villages here, can you tell me? If he is like what you say, my friend, he is a little stranger. Such persons pass through these parts. We know nothing of them. Jean Valjean seized two more coins of five francs each with violence and gave them to the priest. For your poor, he said. Then he added wildly, Monsieur l'abbé, have me arrested, I am a thief. The priest put spurs to his horse and fled in haste, much alarmed. Jean Valjean set out on a run in the direction which he had first taken. In this way he traversed a tolerably long distance, gazing, calling, shouting, but he met no one. Two or three times he ran across the plain towards something which conveyed to him the effect of a human being reclining or crouching down. It turned out to be nothing but brushwood or rocks, nearly on a level with the earth. At length, at a spot where three paths intersected each other, he stopped. The moon had risen. He sent his gaze into the distance and shouted for the last time, Little Gervais, Little Gervais, Little Gervais. His shout died away in the mist without even awakening an echo. He murmured yet once more, Little Gervais, but in a feeble and almost inarticulate voice. It was his last effort. His legs gave way abruptly under him, as though an invisible power had suddenly overwhelmed him with the weight of his evil conscience. He fell exhausted on a large stone, his fists clenched in his hair and his face on his knees, and he cried, I am a wretch. Then his heart burst and he began to cry. It was the first time that he had wept in nineteen years. When Jean Valjean left the bishop's house, he was, as we have seen, quite thrown out of everything that had been his thought hitherto. He could not yield to the evidence of what was going on within him. He hardened himself against the angelic action and the gentle words of the old man. You have promised me to become an honest man. I buy your soul. I take it away from the spirit of perversity. I give it to the good God. This recurred to his mind unceasingly. To this celestial kindness he opposed pride, which is the fortress of evil within us. He was indistinctly conscious that the pardon of this priest was the greatest assault and the most formidable attack which had moved him yet, that his obduracy was finally settled if he resisted this clemency, that if he yielded he should be obliged to renounce that hatred with which the actions of other men had filled his soul through so many years, and which pleased him, that this time it was necessary to conquer or to be conquered and that a struggle, a colossal and final struggle, had been begun between his viciousness and the goodness of that man. In the presence of these lights he proceeded like a man who is intoxicated. As he walked thus with haggard eyes did he have a distinct perception of what might result to him from his adventure at D. 
Did he understand all those mysterious murmurs which warn or importune the spirit at certain moments of life? Did a voice whisper in his ear that he had just passed the solemn hour of his destiny, that there no longer remained a middle course for him, that if he were not henceforth the best of men, he would be the worst, that it behooved him now, so to speak, to mount higher than the bishop or fall lower than the convict, that if he wished to become good, he must become an angel, that if he wished to remain evil, he must become a monster. Here again, some questions must be put, which we have already put to ourselves elsewhere. Did he catch some shadow of all this in his thought, in a confused way? Misfortune, certainly, as we have said, does form the education of the intelligence. Nevertheless, it is doubtful whether Jean Valjean was in a condition to disentangle all that we have here indicated. If these ideas occurred to him, he but caught glimpses of rather than saw them, and they only succeeded in throwing him into an unutterable and almost painful state of emotion. On emerging from that black and deformed thing which is called the galleys, the bishop had hurt his soul as too vivid a light would have hurt his eyes on emerging from the dark. The future life, the possible life which offered itself to him henceforth, all pure and radiant, filled him with tremors and anxiety. He no longer knew where he really was. Like an owl who should suddenly see the sun rise, the convict had been dazzled and blinded, as it were, by virtue. That which was certain, that which he did not doubt, was that he was no longer the same man, that everything about him was changed, that it was no longer in his power to make it as though the bishop had not spoken to him and had not touched him. In this state of mind he had encountered little Gervais and had robbed him of his forty sous. Why? He certainly could not have explained it. Was this the last effect and the supreme effort, as it were, of the evil thoughts which he had brought away from the galleys? A remnant of impulse, a result of what is called in statics acquired force? It was that, and it was also perhaps even less than that. Let us say it simply, it was not he who stole, it was not the man, it was the beast, who by habit and instinct had simply placed his foot upon that money, while the intelligence was struggling amid so many novel and hitherto unheard of thoughts besetting it. When intelligence reawakened and beheld that action of the brute, Jean Valjean recoiled with anguish and uttered a cry of terror. It was because, strange phenomenon, and one which was possible only in the situation in which he found himself, in stealing the money from that child, he had done a thing of which he was no longer capable. However that may be, this last evil action had a decisive effect on him. It abruptly traversed that chaos which bore in his mind and dispersed it, placed on one side the thick obscurity and on the other the light, and acted on his soul in the state in which it then was, as certain chemical reagents act upon a troubled mixture by precipitating one element and clarifying the other. First of all, even before examining himself and reflecting all bewildered, like one who seeks to save himself, he tried to find the child in order to return his money to him. Then, when he recognized the fact that this was impossible, he halted in despair. At the moment when he exclaimed, I am a wretch, he had just perceived what he was, and he was already separated from himself to such a degree that he seemed to himself to be no longer anything more than a phantom, and as if he had, therefore before him in flesh and blood, the hideous galley convict, Jean Valjean, cudgel in hand, his blouse on his lips, his knapsack filled with stolen objects on his back, with his resolute and gloomy visage, with his thoughts filled with abominable projects. Excess of unhappiness had, as we have remarked, made him in some sort a visionary. This, then, was in the nature of a vision. He actually saw that Jean Valjean, that sinister face before him. He had almost reached the point of asking himself who that man was, and he was horrified by him. His brain was going through one of those violent and yet perfectly calm moments in which reverie is so profound that it absorbs a reality. One no longer beholds the object which one has before one, and one sees as though apart from oneself the figures which one has in one's own mind. Thus he contemplated himself, so to speak, face to face, and at the same time, athwart this hallucination, he perceived in a mysterious depth the sort of light which he at first took for a torch. On scrutinizing this light, which appeared to his conscience with more attention, 
he recognized the fact that it possessed a human form and that this torch was the bishop. His conscience weighed in turn these two men thus placed before it, the bishop and Jean Valjean. Nothing less than the first was required to soften the second. By one of those singular effects which are peculiar to this sort of ecstasies, in proportion as his reverie continued, as the bishop grew great and resplendent in his eyes, so did Jean Valjean grow less and vanish. After a certain time he was no longer anything more than a shade. All at once he disappeared. The bishop alone remained. He filled the whole soul of this wretched man with a magnificent radiance. Jean Valjean wept for a long time. He wept burning tears. He sobbed with more weakness than a woman, with more fright than a child. As he wept, daylight penetrated more and more clearly into his soul. An extraordinary light, a light at once ravishing and terrible. His past life, his first fault, his long expatiation, his external brutishness, his internal hardness, his dismissal to liberty, rejoicing in manifold plans of vengeance, what had happened to him at the bishops, the last thing that he had done, that theft of forty sous from a child, a crime all the more cowardly and all the more monstrous since it had come after the bishop's pardon. All this recurred to his mind and appeared clearly to him, but with a clearness which he had never hitherto witnessed. He examined his life, and it seemed horrible to him, his soul, and it seemed frightful to him. In the meantime a gentle light rested over this life and this soul. It seemed to him that he beheld Satan by the light of paradise. How many hours did he weep thus? What did he do after he had wept? Whither did he go? No one ever knew. The only thing which seems to be authenticated is that the same night the carrier who served Grenoble at that epoch, and who arrived at D about three o'clock in the morning, saw, as he traversed the street in which the bishop's residence was situated, a man in the attitude of prayer, kneeling on the pavement in the shadow, in front of the door of the Monsignor Welcome.